Let's get right down to it. Unless you've got the patience of Job or some kind of masochist, you shouldn't play Final Fantasy XIV. Maybe in the months and years to come, Square Enix will issue enough patches to clean up the interface and iron out its technical issues. But as of right now, this is not a world worth visiting. Hello, Eorzeans! Welcome to the Fall and Rise of Final Fantasy XIV, Episode 4! Thanks again for the amazing feedback on my previous video, it is appreciated as always. Now let's get into the episode. The Final Fantasy XIV dev team is being restructured. While Hiromichi Tanaka is removed as producer, Nobuaki Komoto was moved over from director to lead game designer, and thus continues to serve the game. Massive shifts in the overall structure of the dev team occurred, leaving few remaining of the original dev team. Naoki Yoshida was to lead the new dev team into battle. He knew the game had issues, but once he was made aware of the technical aspects of the game, it became clear that he was dealt a losing hand. Just looking at the crafting and gathering system shows you how complicated the problems were. Let's first look at crafting. Final Fantasy XIV was supposed to be a strong, player-driven economy and thus gear did not drop from enemies. You had to buy gear from the market wards. And the gear was to be crafted by the game's crafters, with materials provided by gatherers. Too bad then, that the crafting system was more complicated than a Rubik's Cube. Any 2.x, 3.x crafters watching right now, grab a Prozac, cause shit is about to get 1.0. In order to start crafting, you had to first equip a crafting main hand tool. Once this was done, you became the class associated with that tool. A menu item now pops up in the main menu called Synthesize. Wait for a few seconds while uh, the action loads. Uh... Okay, okay. This tiny menu in the upper left appears. The top section shows the materials you wish to use, and the lower section is where you select whether you wish to use your main hand or offhand for crafting. There was no recipe list in 1.0, so you'd have to know beforehand what materials you needed for the item you were going to make. So you place the required items in the slots, and then select the tool you wish to use for the synthesis. A recipe confirmation window shows up, click confirm, and away we go. The first thing you'll notice is this rapidly decreasing timer counting down. You have to choose an action before the timer reaches zero to progress. Failure to do so will lead to a botched synthesis. There is also a progress bar, a durability rating, and a quality rating. Once your progress bar reached 100%, you were given the option to either finish the synthesis or touch up to increase quality. Quality increased based on your gear and the way you synthesized the item. Touching up would further increase the quality as long as you had remaining durability. It was not a bad system, just a bit tedious a word often used to describe most aspects of 1.0. The problem with this system was that it had incredibly long animations and was extremely prone to server latency. Remember that timer there? Well, if you were a high level crafter and actually had to think about your next move, you could very well have time left on the timer, but the delay between your input and the server response could often lead to a botched synthesis. But this is not even the worst part. The worst part is the actual recipe system and the lack of a recipe book. You had to know what items you needed from memory, or by writing it down in the journal they included in the collector's edition. To craft items, you had to craft a lot, and I mean a lot of items. Take a square maple shield, for example. A basic wooden shield. Well, to make that lovely item, you'd first need to make a maple plank from a maple log, then make 30 bronze nuggets from tin ore and 3 copper ore. Please keep in mind that there is no quick synthesis in the game, you had to go through the same set of menus for every item. Then, from all these nuggets, you'd have to make bronze rivets, bronze nails, and a bronze ingot. From the bronze ingot, make a bronze plate. Then, take some willow chips and sheepskin to make sheep leather. 
Then, take the sheep leather and make sheep leather strap. Now, place all the items you have created in the crafting menu. The sheep leather strap, the bronze plate, the bronze nails, the bronze rivets, and the maple planks. And start synthesizing! And voila! You've got yourself a maple shield. Okay, I'm not gonna go deeper into the crafting aspect here, that's more than enough. Time for the gathering system! Okay, there isn't much to say about it, other than it being incredibly convoluted and RNG based. If you've played the mining and botany minigame in the gold saucer, you've basically tried it. Let's take botany as an example. When you've found a node and started your gathering, you'll get this vertical bar with a slider you can move up and down. This decided what portion of the tree you wanted to gather from. Please, take a gander at how slow the server responds to this. The next step was the actual chop. You now had to attempt to find something in this part of the tree, and this is how you did it. At the second step, you click chop. A marker appears on this thing, and it starts moving up and down. You could not control this motion, by the way, and from the clues given to you in the little window and chat, you either had to go up or down from that mark you've started chopping from. If you're lucky, you hit some good stuff. You also had a limited number of attempts at a node indicated by this bar. You never really knew what you'd be getting, so you had to prepare to spend a lot of time for this. And getting anything in high quality was also left to chance. So gathering certain items was a living nightmare. And good luck hitting your target. The input lag made this so hard, few players actually bothered doing this. And then there was fishing. Uh, I'm just gonna show you this clip of fishing in action. I don't, I don't think any words can explain this better than, than this video. Yeah, yeah. This, um, this right here. This, this was 1.0 fishing. Naoki Yoshida's mission was clear. Make Final Fantasy XIV playable and make it the game it deserves to be. One of the first updates Yoshida and his team pushed out was the item search feature, allowing you to actually search the market wards for the items you needed. In addition to this, the wards were renamed to more easily reflect what they contained, making purchasing items a slightly easier task. Another thing that was added early was Rowena... Rowena? Rowena? Rowena and her elegant runestone system. These stones dropped from faction leave quests and could be exchanged for gear. Finally, an alternate way of obtaining this. The three different types of treasure chests were also introduced, the bronze, silver and gold chest. Yoshida's team's first major patch was patch 115A, which saw the introduction of 99 stacks for crafter items and the options to hide headgear. Massive quality of life changes such as mouse scroll speed adjustments being added to settings minimap reflecting passive or active mode, and finally graphical adjustments to cope with the frame rate drops. Yoshida also decided that it was about time the game got an official forum, where the dev team could stay in touch with the community and receive feedback directly from the players. And thus, the Final Fantasy XIV official forums were born. The next major update, Patch 116, finally introduced proper side quests. And crafters rejoiced as the option to continue crafting the same item immediately after crafting an item was added. Enemies were adjusted in size, as well as getting icons reflecting whether they are hostile or not. While Yoshi P and his team is working on fixing the game, there is a desperate battle being fought internally in Square Enix. The company is bleeding financially, and it becomes clear that Hiromishi Tanaka is not the only one to blame for Final Fantasy XIV's poor status. Square Enix themselves are to blame for pushing the 1.0 dev team to release Final Fantasy XIV before it was ready. CEO of Square Enix, Yoichi Wada, tries to calm their investors, but he needs a miracle in order to turn this around. Square Enix is literally pouring money into an endless sink. Final Fantasy XIV is having a massive impact on Square Enix's finances, and if the game doesn't turn around soon, they might be in serious trouble. Meanwhile, Patch 117 rolls out on April 14th, 2011, introducing a new maximum party size. In 1.0, you could form a party with up to 15 other players. This was reduced in 117 to the setup that is still present in the current incarnation of Final Fantasy XIV, 8 players. This patch in particular patched a lot of the major issues with the game and made it more stable. It was around this time, however, that the dev team came to the horrendous conclusion that the game was so fundamentally flawed, it could never be fully repaired. The server structure, the game engine, the programming, 
it was all broken and difficult to repair. In addition to this, the world design was sloppy and full of glitches that were hard to locate and fix. Even if they made the game playable, they would never be able to expand the game, as the game's engine was already pushed way beyond its limits, not to mention, optimizing this game for the PS3 seemed impossible. They had to make a decision. Fast. Could they really abandon a Final Fantasy title? Doing so would leave a hole in the Final Fantasy timeline, a game that was so bad it had to be shut down in less than a year. It would enrage the fans and permanently damage the Final Fantasy brand. But Yoshida and his crew had a different idea. One so wild, it had never been done on such a scale in an MMO before. They wanted to rebuild the game, from scratch, while the original game was still running and getting patched. They then wanted the 1.x game to end entirely, being replaced by 2.0. It was not easy to convince Square Enix to accept the idea, but their hands were more or less tied. If they didn't do anything, they might lose the entire Final Fantasy franchise. In June of 2011, patch 1.18 was released, and adjustments to the main scenario was finally made. Level caps for the story quests were lowered to make the quests easier to obtain, and giving less dead time between the quests. And finally, the grand companies opened their doors for civilians, as well as massive changes to leave quests, introducing grand company leave quests, which awarded the new currency grand company seals. And ladies and gentle rose, as of patch 118, Eorzeans could finally enjoy instance dungeons. The four-man dungeon The Thousand Maws of Todorak and the eight-man dungeon Zamal Darkhold. In addition to all this, the map was now populated by small settlements to add menders, vendors, and quest NPCs to the overworld. And gods be praised, auto attack was finally implemented as well. Actually, 118 was probably the point where the game started to become playable, as it provided some much needed adjustments to all the classes in the game. In fact, this patch is so massive, I can't even list them here. So, link to this patch in the description <laughs> if you're interested. After the release of this patch, a sense of relief was slowly making its way through the frail and small Final Fantasy XIV community. The game was surely on the rise again. The game still had no subscription model, so the game saw a slight increase in the player base as a result, but the game was still not doing anywhere near as good as expected. Square Enix greenlights Yoshida's plan to reboot the game, and Yoshida soon meets up with the main scenario team. For 1.0, Yoshida had envisioned an end-of-the-world event was unsure how to initiate such a scenario. One of Hydlin's moons, Dalamud, was originally intended to be used in future content patch or expansion, but Naoki Yoshida asked the scenario team if it was okay to bring the moon down to end 1.0 and he got the thumbs up to do so. As patch 119 was released, on the game's one year anniversary, Dalamud, which had previously been a tiny white speck in the sky, finally changed color to a weak red. The plan is now officially in motion. In addition to this, hey! Personal chocobos were finally introduced! During TGS in 2011, Square Enix CEO Yoichi Wada publicly apologized for the state of the game and said that the Final Fantasy brand had been greatly damaged. He continued by saying, We'll continue with our reform work, which basically amounts to fully redoing the game, and hope to revive the Final Fantasy XIV that should have been released. At the time, it was assumed that fully redoing the game just meant heavy patching, but little did they know that Eorzea was edging ever closer to the game-ending calamity. Two weeks later, Yoichi Wada posts on the Final Fantasy XIV homepage. He explains that they are moving forward in the updates, but that much still remains. Then he drops the bomb. The game will relaunch as version 2.0, not explaining how or what it entails, but the subscriptions were reinstated to help finance the relaunch. Meanwhile, the game would receive continuous updates. Version 2.0 did not get a definite launch date, but 2012 was used as a target year. Concept art for the relaunch and updates leading up to it was released, and slowly, hype was once again starting to build. In December of 2011, patch 120 was released. Dalamud is now visibly bigger in the sky. One major change that occurred with this patch was the abolishment of two independent leveling systems. Now being one unified level system, one class had to go. The Sentinel. An obscure class in Final Fantasy XIV, the Sentinel was basically only used as a necessary subclass for Gladiator, as the Sentinel used shields to attack. 
Sentinel skills became gladiator abilities, and the rest is history. Rest in peace, sweet prince. In February of 2012, Square Enix announces that the server mergers will occur, and all players had one month to choose their new server before the merger. Failure to do this would default your character to whatever server your old server was designated to merge into. This would reduce Final Fantasy XIV servers from 18 to 10. All worlds were renamed during the merger. Selbina became Riddle, Wu Tai and Jusal became Masamun, Rabanaster and Cornelia became Durandal, Melmond and Figaro became Aegis, Istory and Mysidia became Gugner, Saronia and Lindblom became Sargitanus, Fabulb and Besaid became Balmung, Trabia and Kashuan became Hyperion, Karnak, Palmitia and Bottom became Excalibur, and out of nowhere, Ragnarok was born as the first and only European server. Hello, love. And so, in March of 2012, patch 121 was released, and this is where things really start shaping up. The job system is introduced, as well as two new dungeons, the Orem Vale uh, and Cutter's Cry. The Ethernet shards pop up in all the city-states, making it easier to move around, and inns were implemented. At this point, Final Fantasy XIV starts to really come alive. The world seems more complex. There is more stuff to do, whether you were leveling or doing in-game content. And this is where most 1.0 fanboys, in lack of a better word, remembers the joys of the pre a Realm Reborn Final Fantasy XIV. The game still suffered from severe latency, optimization issues, bad performance, still lacking early and end game content available, and of course, the bad publicity the game had received resulting in low server populations. In the midst of all this, work is being done on 2.0. The early stages of development was focused on getting all the aesthetics and lore right. They wanted the transition from 1.0 to 2.0 to be as smooth as possible. But hey, look at the time. Thank you so much for watching this episode, I hope you enjoyed. In the next episode, we'll look at the end of an era, Final Fantasy XIV and 1.0, as well as everything that happened in the time between the 1.0 shutdown to the release of 2.0. Remember to leave a like if you enjoyed this series and want more. And hey, remember to subscribe if you're new around here. Also, leave a comment letting me know what you think of this episode, and let me know what you think is the best feature they added during Yoshi P's 1.0 patching. I'll be back in the fall and rise of Final Fantasy XIV Episode 5. May you ever walk in the light of the crystal.